The murders of Detective Garda Jerry McCabe and my colleague Veronica Gearn in the summer of 1996 led directly to the establishment of the Criminal Assets Bureau. This series tells the inside story of CAB and how it became one of the most effective law enforcement agencies in the world. Team 50, 715, 815. John Daly's on the line. John, good afternoon to you. How's it going, Harry? Yeah, you're in Port Leisure Prison at the I'm moment. I'm in Now, Mr. Williams, many thousand people just say you read your newspaper every Sunday. Uh, almost a million. Do you know how much lies you tell every week? Saying that I carried out armed robberies when I get out on my review. I did not get arrested for any armed robberies. You're in prison serving how many years? It doesn't matter how many years I'm serving. Actually, where do you get the mobile phone you to ring out? Get off the phone, you fucking liar. <laughs> Talk to Joe on 1850 715 815. John Daly won't be giving grief to anyone anymore. Just weeks after tasting freedom from Portleash Prison, the young violent gangster was murdered last October. Five rounds at point blank range outside his family home. Just another casualty in the turf wars being fought on the streets of Irish cities. For several years I've been exposing gangsters and the activities of organized crime. And sometimes it appears or feels that it, nothing has changed during all of that time. But that would be wrong. For many years, Ireland could best be described as a thieves paradise. In the 1980s, as the country was going bust, crime was booming. In these halcyon days, a gangster could live openly in his luxury mansion and enjoy the life of a high-flying executive despite having no gainful employment or a visible means of income. Once a week, he could hop into his top-of-the-range Jaguar or Mercedes and whiz around to the local labour exchange to collect his unemployment benefit. Then later, if he was feeling energetic or needed some real money, he and his cronies could pick out a bank and make a cash withdrawal with the help of a sawn-off shotgun. He could then use the cash to buy in several kilos of hash, heroin or cocaine and have his flunkies distributed for him. All he had to do was sit back and wait for the money to roll in. And if the cops got lucky, they might put a crime boss away. But they could do nothing about his dirty money. And it sat there safely in a bank vault waiting for him to collect upon his release. In terms of armed robberies, if the Gardaí were not successful in apprehending the robbers after the armed robbery and seizing the cash, it was very difficult afterwards to seize the cash if you couldn't identify it as coming from that particular place. Similarly, with property and investments they made as well, that we were our hands were tied in that particular regard. And you had the ridiculous situation at times when you had these people who, from whom we had seized money, large sums of money, going back into the courts afterwards all of us knowing where the money came from and under a police property application getting the money restored to them by order of the court i became state solicitor for cork city in june of 1983 from that time on every serious crime file that occurred in cork city which is the biggest area of responsibility for a state solicitor outside dublin uh, came across my desk and I was able to discern a pattern over the years. Crimes were becoming more vicious. Before 1980, the priest's house was sacrosanct, convents of nuns were sacrosanct, the elderly were sacrosanct. There was no question of people sexually assaulting the elderly or doing violence to the elderly, even if they were being burgled. And that changed visibly for the worse over that period. The reason for it was drug taking. People who were committing the crimes were on drugs themselves and people were committing crimes for the purpose of getting money to buy drugs. I've represented Dublin South East now for nearly 30 years 
And I saw in those inner city communities um, before the Celtic Tiger, families struggling to put bread on the table and being affronted by guriers uh, who were relatives of small drug dealers, who were runners for the bigger drug dealers, who were flaunting their wealth and who were making a mockery of people trying to get up early in the morning and go to work. Years of neglect had created a monster. In the summer of 1996, the underworld overstretched itself. Two events within the space of three weeks created a state of fear that rocked the foundations of the Irish Republic. On the morning of June the 7th, Detective Guard Jerry McCabe and his partner Ben O'Sullivan were providing an armed escort for a post office truck in County Limerick when they were suddenly ambushed. The STS van pulled up here just outside the post office, which is almost across the road. And I stopped slightly maybe forward of that jeep over there. And just shortly after stopping, I saw a Pajero jeep coming up at speed behind us. I saw a group of men, individuals, to my right, as in the tin past two position. When the shooting ceased, I saw Jerry's right hand going into spasm. And uh, I knew Jerry was dead. Very quickly, our intelligence indicated to us who was responsible, uh, that it was a, an active service unit of the Southern Command of the Provisional IRA. While lots of people were trying to suggest we keep an open mind for whatever reasons, we focused straight away on the main culprits because we knew our intelligence was good and we knew who had carried it out. And they'd carried out many robberies before, as it was the role of the Southern Command at that particular time to provide the logistical support for Northern Command in, in its uh, so-called war in Northern Ireland. Well, in fairness to them, what, what they did was carry out this act, having been authorised by someone within the IRA. To... It was a challenge to the state because Jerry McCabe's murder reminded us that despite the ceasefire, despite the peace process that was in existence then, there were still people who were acting uh, illegally and carrying out these kind of robberies and willing and able to kill a policeman on duty. It's not the man who wraps the green flag round him who is the patriot. It is the man who stands by the flag. McCabe stood by the flag. Those who shot him denigrated it. Just three weeks later, while the investigation into the McCabe murder consumed the force, the aftermath of a court case in Nace terrified the Irish public. The extent of the crime uh, in Dublin City particularly is just alarming and the inability of the guards because of the legislation to really do anything about it or to properly address it is something that has to be publicised. Now when we do it we're effectively bringing pressure onto the criminals and uh, either by guards or by legislation and they just don't like it. I'm not the only crime reporter that sure. you know does this and I think that the regrettable thing is that we're all probably targets, unfortunately. Veronica Gearn was a colleague of mine and she'd exposed some of the kingpins of the crime scene in Ireland. And for that, someone decided she had to die. On the afternoon of the 26th of June, 1996, Veronica was shot five times at point-blank range with a powerful Magnum handgun as she sat in traffic on the Nace Road near Dublin. Despite the fact that there was an attack in her house and she had been shot, I don't think uh, that anybody would visualise the situation prior to the 26th of June of 96, where anybody would even have a thought of uh, assassinating her. I think this is the most dangerous, most dreadful precedent ever been set in Irish gangland. I think if this, these guys get away with this, God knows where it's going to go. Who's next? 
You knew Veronica. Mm -hmm. The Veronica you knew wasn't an awful lot different to the Veronica I knew. She didn't have a, a public persona. She was the same all of the time. And she loved her job. She loved her job. Tell me about the day, the time that you heard Veronica had been murdered. She was murdered on the yeah, 26th of June, 1996. She rang me on she, she, she was murdered Wednesday, the 26th of June. She rang me on Tuesday night and she said, Mum, what am I say going to in the morning? So I told her and she said, well, will you say a special prayer? I'm in court. And uh, I said, oh, my God, Veronica, you know, I said, you're not speeding again, are you? The next day, Veronica appeared at Nace District Court to face the music for a speeding offence. The judge was lenient. He fined her 100 pounds. Veronica thought this was her lucky day and called her mother with the good news. She phoned and she was on top of the world and she said, Mum, I got off, she said. I was only fined 100 pounds and now I won't lose my license or anything. So I said, oh, thank God, Veronica, that's wonderful. Tony Hickey told me afterwards. Right. Three minutes and 48 seconds after we spoke, she was dead. Veronica was a friend of mine. I knew her for a long number of years. We'd worked together on the New Ireland Forum in the 80s, and um, we got on very well together. My first instinct was, here is a young mother. That was my first instinct. I thought, oh, Lord, for her family, for her child, for her husband. That was my first thought. The, the rest of it, the implications of a journalist being murdered, came a little bit later. In any society, when a young mother is shot down in cold blood by thugs and gorillas of the lowest type. And when they think that they can get away with it, then society has a duty to respond. Within hours of the murder on Main Street Adair, the police knew that the provisional IRA had killed Jerry McCabe. In Veronica's case, the prime suspect was identified within minutes. It didn't take a genius to figure it out. The clues were strewn all over the murder scene. The main suspect at the moment today is a man in his 40s who has a major criminal empire built around himself, who obviously considers himself untouchable, who considers himself above the law. For legal reasons, I couldn't name John Gilligan at the time. He was the small man who had suddenly become Mr. Big. A year earlier, in September 1995, Veronica had confronted a little bully to ask him about the source of his mysterious wealth. All she got by way of a response was a savage beating. Veronica visited Gilligan in his home one morning in the, the autumn of the previous year. And to put it mildly, he wasn't pleased. He has been a volatile temper. And uh, he assaulted her. And uh, she subsequently made a complaint. It would seem from the evidence we had that John Gilligan decided that he was never going to prison again and that if he did even for six months or 12 months which was a possibility he would lose his contacts abroad and that the whole thing would crumble Coming so soon after a dare there was now a feeling that nobody was safe a ruthless drug gang had just joined the IRA as the enemies of the people. Together, they showed that they were prepared to kill anyone who got in their way. Who 
brings in the guns? The same guys who bring in the drugs. That a journalist should be callously murdered in the line of duty is an attack on democracy as a whole because it is an attack on one of the pillars of our democracy. The full resources of the state will be brought to bear in bringing to justice those responsible for today's murder. Veronica Gearn deserves no less. But the public was sceptical. They feared that the politicians would chicken out once again. After all, the track record of successive governments did not inspire much confidence. There was a feeling in society that this problem was not being dealt with. And indeed, there was a feeling in some quarters, justifiably in my view, that the state's own institutions were not sufficiently armed or resourced with a view to dealing with the problem. This, as far as I was concerned, was an attack by a criminal underclass against the democratic state and the agents of the state and the citizens of the state. When she was murdered, I felt as if it could have been me or it could have been anybody else who was in that kind of position. And I knew that all the previous kinds of attempts to up the game and to coordinate cooperation between the different agencies of the state, that was all over. We now had to move really quickly. This was for real. This was serious. Looking back on it, and at the time we realised, and we all have to put our hands up in relation to this, there was failure on all our parts. There was failure in law enforcement, in all its aspects. Other agencies of the state uh, failed, politicians failed, society failed. We all failed in a way. The immediate result was a complete loss of confidence in the Irish public in the criminal justice system. And it was more or less an obvious consequence of the lack of action up to then. The criminal underworld, particularly those involved in drug trafficking and to an equal extent organised crime, had got so powerful that they were now literally taking on the state and the government and the press. I mean, Veronica Guerin's death was directly attributable to her bravery in publishing the articles in ever-increasing detail about people flaunting criminal wealth. John Gilligan was a criminal all his life. Throughout most of the 1980s, he was the leader of the so-called factory gang. They had specialised in the wholesale plundering of warehouses and factories across the country. In 1990, he was finally caught and jailed for four years. Hey, John, hey, hey, look around here now, John Gilligan. Oh, he's about 14 feet. Oh, he's gone down to five foot six. Oh, he's gone up to another 14 feet. <laughs> In Port Leash, he gathered the nucleus of a new gang around him. By the time he was released in 1994, he had decided to embark on a new business, drugs, and he had vowed that he would never again serve time in prison. The, the amazing thing about the Gilligan gang was that they had only been released from prison for about two and a half, three years before June of 96, and they had made spectacular uh, connections abroad and spectacular profits, and they had uh, succeeded in importing amazing amount of drugs into this country. They flaunted their, their riches quite openly and uh, they got used to a certain lifestyle and they became quite arrogant. It says a lot about the state of organised crime in Ireland in the 1990s that a low-life villain like John Gilligan could challenge the power of the state and think he could get away with it. For many years, drug dealers, gangsters and terrorists exploited lax laws and loopholes to protect their fast crime profits. With so much wealth, they considered themselves untouchable and no one was going to take it away from them. For almost two decades, armed robbery was the stock and trade of a generation of young criminals. But by the late 1980s, the gangsters soon realised that one good drug deal could earn them a lot more money with a lot less risk than a few bank jobs. I suppose in 1979 the big development in the city of Dublin was that heroin arrived and the Dunn family are credited, quite rightly so, with bringing heroin in pretty large quantities into the city. Larry Dunn and his brothers were career criminals who made their mark by specialising in bank robberies. But when heroin arrived on the streets of Dublin, the Dunns were the first to decommission their balaclavas and getaway cars and earn some serious money. It was said at the time that the Duns did for smack 
what Henry Ford did for the motor car, made it available to the working man and woman, even the kids on the dole, even the kids at school. When a tax inspector actually had the temerity to ask Dunn where all the money came from, he barked at him and said, Where the fuck do you think I got it? Oh, you robbed it. I think criminals were ducking and weaving between the different agencies. They were making a nonsense of the tax system at one level. They were making a nonsense of the law where, in fact, money that they couldn't establish the origin of was still their money and they could go into a Garda station and game famously get their money back. All of these kinds of things. I mean, the, the mockery that the general Martin Cowell had made of due process and procedure, the famous Mickey Mouse T-shirt and all of that kind of thing, they were just fingers in the eyes, you know, just prodding it into to the entire state. If you have any evidence, you should charge it. If you're innocent, you don't need a balaclava. Probably if I was guilty, I probably wouldn't. Seen that I'm innocent, I do. Mickey Mouse! <laughs> Martin Cahill never did an honest day's work in his life. Yet he could afford to buy a big house in Rap Mines and had enough money to support his wife, her sister, and their nine children on the proceeds of burglaries, robberies, and kidnapping, while all the time drawing the dole. It was quite obvious what was happening in local communities. When ordinary decent people were getting up in the morning to go to work, at six and seven o'clock and heading off and seeing certain people in the community who never got out of bed until about 12 or one o'clock in the day didn't bother to work but had a brand new car outside the door had all the house done up with the best of furniture this was being replicated right around the country this security footage sums up the era of the thieves paradise it's february 25th in 1992, and here is Martin Cahill strolling into the Allied Irish Bank branch on Moorhampton Road in Dublin. He lodges over £20,000 in cash, most of it in £50 notes, which he changed for a bank draft. The bank draft is later used as a deposit to buy a house. 30 minutes later, two armed raiders enter the bank and head to the same counter where Cahill had earlier lodged his cash. During the two-minute heist, one of the raiders demanded to know where the rest of the 50s were kept. They left with £11,000 of Martin Cahill's original lodgement. Increasingly, I was aware that the general, um, Mr Cahill, was not just sticking to his own trade and robbing and stealing, but there was an element of fear coming through the community. In public, the general posed as a joker and a showman, but there was a sinister, sadistic side to the character of Martin Cahill. And then I read about the event where the social welfare official who had uh, knocked him off his monies uh, was taken out, captured by the general, and strapped to the railway line at the back of Queen of Peace Church in Marion. And apparently Cahill then shot him, fortunately with no great permanent injuries. But we were talking about this at home some weeks later, and my niece, who was in an apartment quite close, said, I heard that. I heard that guy screaming. And I sort of said to myself, what kind of a society is it that allows people to do these kinds of things? And what kind of democracy is it that allows people elected to power in office, like myself, to tolerate a situation where they have the impunity to act like that and not have the full rigours of the state on behalf of ordinary decent citizens come down and hit them hard. One public servant, Dr James Donovan, the forensic scientist central to a Garda case against Martin Cahill, was the victim of a sinister attack. In January of 82, I was driving in the car, but suddenly, as I looked through the windscreen, the windscreen sort of disappeared into blackness. And um, there was a, a, a cloud of dust with a, a tongue of flame in the middle of it. And then almost a considerable amount of time afterwards, I heard the noise. And I put my hand down on my left side and found a, a mixture of blood and gunge and cloth and broken bones. And... Um, well, they'd, they'd put a bomb. They, they had um, severely damaged my left leg, essentially removed the left foot, um, 
did some damage to the right foot, a fair amount of damage to the right foot. The uh, hand was paralysed and, and, and wasn't of use for a considerable length of time. What I've heard from the Gardaí over the years, they say Martin Carl did it. He got the INLA to manufacture a bomb and, and he apparently came out to where I live that night and supervised the positioning of the bomb at the manifold of the car. Um, I think if I did not drive with my legs out straight, I would the legs would have been removed and the blood would have uh, the loss of blood uh, would have finished me. Martin Cahill was never brought to justice for his role in the attempt to murder Dr. James Donovan. Over 25 years after the bomb attack, James Donovan is still paying the price for doing his job. His awful wounds have never healed, and he lives on a daily cocktail of powerful painkillers just to make life bearable. Pain has just gone on and on and on. And it's, it's in legs and in my hands and elsewhere. The, the left foot gets infections, or otherwise it, it, uh, it, it just gets, it just decides to bleed. I don't know why. I don't know how long it's going to bleed, but obviously I've got to dress it twice a day. I, I can never forget, I can never put what happened behind me and say, well, that's, that's it. I had always thought that I could put a square around the event and forget, forget it. But I can't forget it, ever. Even so prepared to use them. Who else will name and shame the drug lords? As the state solicitor, Barry Galvin prosecuted all criminal cases in Cork from the early 1980s. Galvin was increasingly frustrated with a criminal justice system that had failed to keep pace with changing trends in underworld activity. In 1992, he decided to go public and appeared on The Late Late Show. It's an extraordinary tale. Let's talk to him. His name is Barry Galvin. By that stage, I had developed uh, a concern that the criminals and drug trafficking was gaining ground and nothing was being done about it. And I was asked would I say on the Late Late Show what I'd been saying in a number of interviews, and I said I would, and, and, and I did. He tells us now that West Cork and part of Kerry, a little part of Clare, has now become established as the headquarters of international drug smuggling in Europe. One of the reasons why I was so anxious should be highlighted because nothing is being done about it. And the, it has got very considerably worse, both in supply of drugs and in associated violent crime. Are we talking about major drug dealers? You're Big talking business. about the biggest drug dealers in Europe. And why have they come here? Because they've been run out of everywhere else. Why can't these guys be got? Well, they can be got if there's the political will to do it. These people have huge means, very high lifestyle. Um, they're laundering money throughout legitimate business in Ireland. And the most obvious way of catching them is under the existing tax code. They can be caught now if, if the right thing was done. I was quite amazed at the reaction. The reaction, particularly from the government, was uh, an effort to suppress it and to belie it as being untruthful. The Minister for Justice at the time, Porrick Flynn, rubbished Barry Galvin. He informed the Dáil in his uniquely pompous style that Galvin had been questioned and his claims found to be exaggerated. While there was, he said, a drug problem, it wasn't on the scale suggested by the state solicitor for Cork. I was even more annoyed that, having highlighted it, that instead of dealing with it, taking it on and saying there is a problem and we're going to fix it, they just tried to make it go away and it clearly wasn't going to go away. And of course that was, to, 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 as far as I'm concerned, misleading the Doyle because he knew at the time that there was a serious problem because the reports that I had on file were available to him as Minister for Justice. 
he organised that two senior Gardaí would come to Cork to interview me to check that what I was saying was correct. And one of those guards was um, senior guard Tony Hickey, who I worked with closely afterwards in Dublin. And, of course, they knew that they were being sent on a fool's errand because they had exactly the same information that I had before they came down. But the government persisted in trying to maintain that what I was saying was not correct. But not everyone in Fianna Fáil took the party line on Barry Galvin from P. Flynn. I worked as a solicitor in Limerick in the late 1970s. I worked on the Free Legal Aid panel. I saw at first hand what the destruction of people's lives by criminals could achieve. And I appreciate today that people like Barry Galvin stood in the gap when others did not do so. Padraig Flynn can have his opinion and he's entitled to it. My opinion is entirely different. My opinion accords with Barry Galvin's. Events on the streets prove Barry Galvin had been right all along. In the summer of 1994, Martin Cahill was gunned down by the IRA. Some say with the assistance of John Gilligan and his gang. A week after the hit, two of Gilligan's leading henchmen, Brian Meehan and Peter Fatso Mitchell, were stopped with a carload stuffed with £46,000 in cash. In 1994, I think it was, £30,000 in cash was seized in his car. He obviously would have had no legitimate explanation for having £30,000 at the time. And yet, in a, shortly after, as in a police property application, uh, John Gilligan came and claimed the money was his. John Gilligan told the court that the money belonged to him and that Brian Meehan, a close friend of his, had been minding it. The judge gave it back to him. There was a similar incident in England where I think it was 70,000 uh, the pounds of sterling was seized and police property application was made and he had to be given back the money. And I have been informed anecdotally that on a number of occasions subsequently when Gilligan was stopped in possession of money and asked where did he get the money, he produced the receipt from HM Customs and Excise for the money that they had given him back the first time. John Gilligan was creaming it. In 1995, he splashed out the equivalent of €100,000 for new cars and jeeps for himself and his children alone. One gang member used to store his drug money in a laundry basket, and when it was full, he went out and got another laundry basket. Peter Mitchell once complained to the Gardaí that the media had misrepresented his earning power. I don't earn 50 grand a week, he said. Nothing like it. I only earn 30 grand a week. And that's the fucking truth, lads. Things were so good, they were making so much money. They were importing a certain amount of cocaine for recreational purposes. Uh, they were having a nice time in the, in the better class uh, clubs. Uh, they were driving very nice cars and they had uh, nice properties around the town. And it was a very nice lifestyle as far as they were concerned. At one stage, Gilligan was served with a tax assessment. Uh, he wrote the words, fuck off, on the back of it, put it in an envelope, and sent it back to the taxman. I remember being very disillusioned at these events and thinking, you know, if this, if this is happening, where are we going? Anarchy is around the corner, unless something is done. And I also remember that there was a, a crisis in, of confidence amongst the public. The team that was available to the state, social welfare, the revenue commissioners, the taxation people, um, the guards themselves, and the special sections within the guards, they were all playing, but they weren't playing together and working together. There was a, a breakdown of communications, might be a nice way to put it. We were just weren't dovetailing well as we should have been with social welfare and the other agencies of the state, which was necessary at the time if you were going to counter the activities of these people in terms of the amount of money they were getting from all of this. Gilligan's gang felt invincible. One of them, Peter Fatso Mitchell, 
He even complained to the guards about the trouble he was having with some of his drug dealing staff. He told them, You think that the drugs is an easy business? Well, it's fucking not, lads. I'm paying fellas a thousand pound a week to sell hash and a few E's for me, and do you think I can get the bastards to work? You can't get the fuckers out of the pubs at their beds. It's just not fucking easy. I knew that we had a serious problem out there. And one of the first things I had done as minister was to call the commissioner, the um, deputy commissioner, and all the heads of the various departments in the Garda Shikana. And I sat them down and I said, I do not want to hear you saying we cannot attack this or that or arrest somebody because of lack of legislation. Tell me what it is is missing. I recall being in the Doyle and putting it to John Bruton that we had a really serious problem on our hands and that it was my very strong view that whatever the intentions of his own party might be, that the Labour Party and Democratic Left seemed to have a different view. That theirs appeared to be a liberal viewpoint which was at variance with what the public thought and which was at complete variance with what was actually happening on the streets of our country. I felt at times that I had an uphill battle bringing in some of the legislation that I wanted to bring in, strengthening some of our laws with the advice of the senior guard I'd met at the very beginning of my ministry. There were a number of people in the Labour Party particularly, less so in the Democratic left, but some who did not want to see legislation getting any stronger in the fight against crime uh, for various reasons, human rights, civil rights. And I did find at times that I had to work very hard to get agreement on legislation. There was a certain sense, and I was getting it from some people, that maybe the Labour Party is a bit soft on crime, that maybe the Labour Party is all for the criminal and not for the society that actually suffers it. I had seen too much of what criminal activity had done in my constituency to decent, hard-working families, to the parents of youngsters who had been led astray, and I wanted to be particularly hard on the criminals. If that makes me a, a right-wing <laughs> Labour Party politician, then I'm quite happy to be so on this particular issue. Because the people who were talking about the alienation of the individual and the criminal brought up in a disadvantaged background and the rest of it, whole generations of people that I represented were brought up in disadvantaged environments and they didn't all become criminals. So I wasn't buying the argument that, you know, if you're brought up in a poor background, you've got a predilection to crime and that you should be more or less understood in that particular way. Irish crime bosses hadn't much to fear in the summer of 1996. The government was divided internally. The agents of the state were not working together and didn't know the true extent of organised crime. The state was weak, the people vulnerable, and the gangsters had the upper hand. In 1995, it was easy to see why criminals considered themselves untouchable. They were literally getting away with murder and making lots of money at the same time. A frustrated police force sought a crisis meeting with the then Minister for Justice. Pat Byrne came in with, I think it was Kevin Carthy and Tony Hickey, and he gave us a very frank and open briefing about the life, the underworld in our city and in our country, the kind of people and how they operated. And he gave us names and he described the actions they were doing. He described his frustration at not being able to get at them. I told them exactly what was happening in this country. I told them of the number of gangs that were operating in the different cities, uh, Dublin, Cork, Limerick. Uh, we identified the, uh, the people uh, are, are the key people involved in these gangs, the relationship between these gangs right across the country, what they were involved in, uh, our estimation at the time of how much money they were making, and uh, how it had followed a trend right across the world. I went into a lot of detail as to how they were linked with other criminal gangs, not only in the United Kingdom, but also in Europe as a whole. There was no shortage of Irish villains who thought themselves above the reach of the law. There was no secret about the big three either. 
Jerry the Monk Hutch had started his career as a handbag snatcher and graduated to enjoy his reputation as Ireland's most successful bank robber. Hutch was moving into property development and could openly walk the streets. George the Penguin Mitchell. He had his hands in all the pies. He gorged himself on the proceeds of robberies, rackets and drug trafficking. And the diminutive John Gilligan, who dreamed one day he'd be top of the world. He openly paraded his multi-million pound wealth from drugs. And always remember, money brings influence. You have young people coming up who looked up to these people and said, this is the way to live, because a lot of them were flaunting, flaunting their wealth and what they had achieved through criminality over all these years. Gilligan, in particular, had got used to a certain lifestyle. He had this big horse place out in County Mead, Jasbrook, and he was flaunting his wealth in the most extraordinary way. And his children, his daughter, for example, had a flashy new car and money in her bank account, and yet she was claiming a loan parents' allowance. And likewise, his son, who was a petty drug dealer, was also claiming unemployment assistance. So these kinds of things were going on. Uh, I suppose human nature being what it is, there's greed and there's conflict, and as happens in every country in the world, when people reach that stage, they look around and they try and wipe out the opposition. I'd like to think that I am uh, sort of more conscious of things that may occur, but yeah. In 1996, the only opposition John Gilligan faced was from a journalist. Veronica Gearn had the cheek to ask Gilligan about the source of his riches and received a beating for her trouble. She pressed assault charges and was prepared to testify against the drug baron in open court. He had a history throughout his career of intimidating witnesses and of course he threatened Veronica uh, with dire consequences to herself and her family in particular to her son uh, Cahill. Uh, nevertheless, she decided to, to pursue um, and to give evidence um, in, in the court case. Gilligan decided that if he was out of commission, even for six months and certainly for 12 months, that the international contacts would dry up because he was dealing directly with fairly major, pretty major players in Amsterdam. And um, I think that's what led to the murder in June of 96. On July the 9th, 1996, two weeks after the murder, the charges against John Gilligan, arising from the assault on Veronica Gearn, were struck out at Kilcock District Court in County Kildare. The grounds were that the complainant could not proceed with the case. Veronica Gearn was dead. The name Veronica means image of truth. And I think... For a journalist, that's, that's a lovely name. Yes, yeah. <laughs> the image of truth. I couldn't look at television, nor could I read a paper. I couldn't say dead. I couldn't say murder. mother and a journalist and a very decent decent woman who was a particular friend of mine could be killed in broad daylight in, in, in this country. It was like a wake-up call for everybody, politicians, members of the Garda Chicana, all the different agencies of the state who were dealing in any way uh, with criminal activity as to the position we had arrived at in Irish society in relation to crime. There is no doubt but that the balance had shifted. The balance had shifted in favor of the criminal and away from society. And society was under as much threat at that time from organized crime as it had ever been from terrorism. Here in one month, we had an attack from the Pyra, from the Provisional IRA, on Jerry McCabe and Ben O'Sullivan. And then at the end of the same month, we had a journalist murdered because of her work. It wasn't just a haphazard murder. She was murdered because of her work as a journalist. They felt so powerful that they think they could do this and get away with it. We made our minds up. 
they were not going to get away with it. They were not going to get away with it. Everybody realised that to follow up an organised crime, you've got to follow the money. You've got to get that and where it really hurts. We knew we had no time. We wanted to, like, really just go full blazing at this. Once Veronica's murder galvanised our minds, we just knew we had to go for it and go for it with a very, very concise and, and very, very rapier-like instrument. That seminal moment in which Veronica was shot, I think, woke people up. It was a shock to the system, to everybody in the country, that, you know, these people are gaining the ascendancy in our society and we have to stop them. The people wanted action and they were about to get it. This time, the state would mobilize its muscle and show that it had the power to fight back. For once, the heat would be on the hoods. Let us freeze the assets of the drug barons who are known to us all. All across the country, gangsters raced to empty their bank accounts, and top of the queue were the big players. This was something the underworld never contemplated, that their properties would be seized and taken off. There is now no criminal in Ireland who can enjoy the fruits of his labour in Ireland. A TV3 production, Dirty Money, the story of the Criminal Assets Bureau. Next Monday at 10 on 3. Some papers stop short asking these bully boys, but we don't. Dirty Money, in association with the Sunday World. Caffeine can help you through your day. They can relieve your cold symptoms so you can get back on your feet. Lemsip, here to help. No doubts. What's it like to be part of sports Ooh. history? I, I have no idea. Can't find the words? No, I'm not on the team. I'm just here for the Bud Light. I can, I can get you one. It's a cooler right over here. Are you sure? Woo! Enjoy the lighter side of life. Make it.